Uh, it's, if, if a maximally, it's possible a maximally great bean exists. Mm -hmm. To if it's possible a maximally great bean exists, it exists in some possible world. Mm -hmm. If a maximally great bean exists in some possible world, it exists in every possible world. If a maximally great bean exists in every possible world, it exists in the actual world. Therefore, a maximally great bean exists. Something right, like right. that. So, and then the idea is um, right. that. Uh, a maximally great being um, is one whose existence is necessary, right? Because um, that's how that's how you have to have the argument running to get from it existing in some world, right? So maybe, maybe if I said, look, um, yeah, there's a maximally existing being in some possible world, right? But it doesn't exist in all possible worlds. That's to say that it's a contingently existing being. Right, because exist it, contingency just means true in some world but not in every world. Right, so um, for Plantinga's argument, it needs to be the case that a maximally great being not only exists but necessarily exists. Right, so with what we're saying when we say maximally existing, uh, maximally perfect being is a necessarily existing being, as well as a bunch of other stuff, right? all good and all knowing, blah blah blah. So we can just say. It's possible that a necessary, necessarily existing being exists. Mm -hmm. If a necessarily existing being, um, if it's possible that a necessary existing being exists, then it exists in at least some possible world. But if a necessarily existing being exists in at least one possible world, it exists in all possible worlds. Therefore, it exists in this world. Right? That's basically how the argument goes. Um, and I think you mentioned this objection in the first place, which is that. Um, it seems like on the top on its face that there's just as much reason to think that um unnecessarily existing that, that, that there aren't any necessarily existing beings and that there are right maybe it's not possible that a necessarily existing being exists and if it's not possible that a necessarily existing being exists then there's at least one world where a necessarily existing being doesn't exist but if there's one world where a necessarily existing being doesn't exist it doesn't exist at all possible worlds therefore it's not a necessarily existing being therefore it doesn't exist in this world either right so um the um the intuition that gets you started could go in either direction and i think planting actually admits that that's the case right doesn't, doesn't it's not actually decisive it just, it's a way of articulating um confidence that you might have if you already buy the idea that a necessary existing being exists or you know that god exists it's a way of cashing that out um but you need to swallow the pill in the first premise in order to continue um, yeah, I, th I think he says he thinks it's a sound argument, but he acknowledges that the first premise can't really be supported unless you already think God exists. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think that I also want to uh, quibble about the notion of modality that's involved in the first premise, right? Because there's different meanings to the word possible, of course, right? So um, if I say that something... Um, let's say traveling faster than the speed of light is not physically possible, right? And what that means is something like the laws of physics don't allow it, right? So it, a thing traveling faster than the speed of light and the laws of physics equals a contradiction, right? There's, there's some thing that in laws of physics that forbids that from happening, right? And it's, it's contradicting that. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't, it's not logically impossible, right? If, I, if I'm not thinking about the laws of physics and I'm just thinking about some, some more abstract set of laws, like laws of classical logic, there's nothing in that that says that things can't travel faster than the speed of light. So we might say something like, while a particle traveling faster than the speed of light is physically impossible, it's not logically impossible, right? So we've got like at least two grades of modality already, um, physical and logical. Um, Plantinga wants to be talking about what philosophers call metaphysical modality. And this is already very unclear what metaphysical modality means. Um, it's something slightly stronger than physical modality, but it's not quite as strong as logical modality. So um, let's say something like, uh, I'm not sure if this is the right way to put it, but well, <clears throat> um, let me see what's Kripke's. Um, so um, in the ancient Babylonian 
uh, world, right? The Babylonian astronomers would be looking out at the morning star and the evening star, right? And at that point, they didn't realize that those two things were both Venus. So from their perspective, it was at least possible. And they thought true that the morning star is not the evening star. In actual fact, because the morning star and the evening star always referred, although unknowingly by those people, always referred to the same object, it was supposed to be some metaphysically impossible for the morning star to not be the evening star. And what's going on there is a, there's a distinction between what appears possible to somebody and what is in actual fact possible. Right, so a distinction between an, another two grades of modality, right? the epistemic modality, right? what's true for all I know, and what's true in actual fact, right? and, and the actual basis being what's out there in the world rather than what's in my head. Um, um, and it's not quite clear to me, so, so I guess um, for all I know, there is a necessarily existing being, right? So in a sense, it's epistemically possible that there's a necessarily existing being. Um, so, but is it, um, am I in the position of the ancient Babylonian astronomer who, who thinks that um, Venus, uh, that the morning star isn't the evening star is possible, when actually it isn't, right? I mean, maybe it's not possible that there's a necessarily existing being, for all I know. I don't know everything about metaphysics, right? Maybe, maybe there's something that I'm not getting, which rules that out. Maybe there's some kind of reverse ontological argument, which means that there couldn't be one, right? And that's a matter of necessity. Well. So I'm only going to grant the first premise if what we're talking about is epistemic modality. I mean, sure, it's epistemically possible that there's a necessarily existing being, right? To say it even more stiltedly, it's epistemically possible, as in for all I know it's possible, that there is a being whose existence is metaphysically necessary, right? Who, who you know, in actual fact couldn't not exist. Right? That might be the case for all I know. But also, for all I know, that might not be the case. I don't know, right? I'm, I'm ignorant over the whether or not you know the crucial first premise is that actually something that reality is um minded to permit or whatever the hell we mean by um metaphysical modality like i just don't know whether i should grant that first premise um and, i mean I, I think well i'm i'm minded to say that because i don't know one way or the other it's epistemically possible either direction um but if you're saying, oh, is it metaphysically possible? So the first premise is, it's true that it's metaphysically possible that there's a metaphysically necessary being. Well, I, I just got, I can't grant that premise, right? Because I need some kind of argument in order to give it, right? I don't know whether that's true or not. Maybe it's false. So what's the argument that grounds that first premise and, and makes it the case that it is metaphysically, uh, metaphysically possible that this type of being exists? Well, I think if you... <laughs> If you could answer that question, you'd already have so, such great knowledge of metaphysics that you'd know whether God existed. Right? You, we, we're talking about what, whether a metaphysically necessary being is metaphysically possible or not. Now, it, it seems to me that, that that's an impossible to answer question unless you already have unlocked the kind of deepest secrets of how the world works. Um, and it kind of trades on an ambiguity between my willingness to grant that I don't know whether that's true, which is epistemic, and um, it being a fact in the world that, you know, that's real, a metaphysical possibility. And, you know, I, I will accept, I will give you the epistemic possibility, but I won't give you the metaphysical one. And, and then the problem is that once we're doing epistemic possibility, you can't then say, oh, we're using S5, which is the bit, the step that he has to take from it um, at the end to get it to exist in, um, in in this world as well, I mean, it just might not be true. Um, if if we're using an epistemic modality, it becomes a lot more complicated. Um, it's certainly just not straightforwardly obvious that you're going to be that that S five step is going to work. So uh, that's that's my own particular bugbear with uh, with. I mean, and then you think you can still apply all of the same objections that you could apply to Ansel. I don't really get what what difference it makes to those things. I mean, look for one thing um yeah is is existence um a great making property that's that's debatable obviously but um here's here's another thought which is that greatness itself has to be a certain type of scale for this argument to work right which is like um 
it has to be the type of thing which admits of um, maximal elements in the first place. So let's take numbers, for instance. Um, numbers are ordered by a relation which mathematicians call the greater than relation. I mean, it's not the same type of greatness, right? But it has the same name. Um, and it's illustrative of the idea of there being a relation that doesn't have a, a greatest upper bound, um, or, or at least upper bound, or an upper bound of any description, right? The, um, two is greater than one, three is greater than two, right? That's the ordering that numbers have. It's a linear ordering. Every two numbers, one's greater than the other. Um, now, there's no number such that it's a number greater than which none can be conceived. Right? Any number you pick, I, I can pick another one, right? Um, I, I can pick another one which is greater than that number, right? Any x, there's an x plus one, it's a number. Um, so it's a, a, a greater, greaterness relation that doesn't admit of a maximal element. Now, why should, um, when, when, even if we grant that there are great making properties, um, let's say uh, that being all powerful is a great, or, so, sorry, say that being powerful is a great making property. Um, why should it be the case that um, there's a maximal limit of all powerful? Maybe, maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe that's like saying the greatest number. Right? So you can say those words, it doesn't mean that it that's actually corresponds to a concept. So it's at least plausible, it seems to me, that for any greatness that you can come up with, I can just add, I can conceive of something that's, you know, so you go, well, like my God can, you know, lift this many <laughs> suns or something. I, I'll just say, okay, well, I can think of one, I can lift oh, that many, but with one more, something like, how, why isn't it the case that I can always think of something that's more powerful than any given example of something that you pick, right? So. I'm not even, I mean, you have, for this description, the bright, the beginning of this whole idea is that there's this, um, that great making terminates in some kind of maximal element. And that just seems to me wildly implausible. I mean, there's two types of relation. Right? There's ones that have top upper limits and there's ones that don't. Like numbers is ones that don't. I mean, so an example of the other type is, um, is, um, being more northern, right? So, so for any two points on the surface of the Earth, um, one is either more northern than the other, or the other way around, or they're equilateral, right? Um, but there's a maximal point, which is the North Pole, and there's no, no point on the surface of the Earth which is more northern than the North Pole. It's more northern than every other point. Um, there's no point that's equilateral with it. The absolute pinpoint part of the Earth that's the most north Right. And then there's so, so north has a, a terminal maximal point, but being a greater number doesn't. There's no top number like there is maximally north point on the surface of the Earth. Um, so given that there's those two types of relations, which does being powerful fit into? It's not clear to me that it fits into being more like north than being more like greater number. And in fact, it seems more like being a greater number. Um, I don't know whether being all-knowing fits in one or the other, but it's not clear to me that it does. I already think that being, uh, that I, 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 it's quite clear that being more generous, you can always conceive of something that's more generous than another thing. And I don't see how that can terminate in a maximally generous thing. There's just like instances of greater and greater generosity. And anyway, it seems to me that being over a certain amount is detrimental and too generous is such a thing, right? So maximally generous even if it made sense doesn't seem desirable and yet so, that's supposed to be a great making property of god so i just i i, I guess regarding things like all powerful or all knowing the idea that maximal power or all powerful would be god's ability to do anything logically possible or in terms of all knowing he knows all true propositions so would that be a terminal point or is it possible to conceive of something greater than that um, well, yeah, I, so if I can think of a God that can do contradictory things, is that worse? I mean, why is that worse? And anyway, being able to do all things logically possible. Um, so, okay, so, I mean, this is a really old paradox, but then if that's all there is to it, then um, there's things that God, so there's things that God can't do, right? Like making the stone is too heavy for him to lift. Um, but that seems like a kind of strange limitation. Um, 
and maybe it's logically and uh, maybe there's some like weird logical problem with that. But I can certainly conceive of something who can do that. Um, so it's not it's not something greater than which none can be conceived. I mean, I, I just said it out loud for one thing. Um, I mean, even if I'm entertaining a contradiction when I do so, I, I seem to be able to conceive of something doing that. So why is that not greater? Um, or, you know, if God's bound by the laws of logic, say, um, well, pick, pick a set of laws of logic, um, and then I'll just give you the same, I'll give you a weaker system that has less laws in it. Um, if God's bounded by, so I don't know, say classical logic, let's just say for, for argument's sake that it had three laws, um, which isn't the right way of thinking about these things, but um, okay, well, I'll just give you a weaker logic that has two laws in it. So now my God, which can do everything logically um, permissible, can do more than yours can, because there's a different type of logic on, that's at least potential, it's on the table. So um, I'm, I just don't feel, I don't feel like we're on solid ground here. It feels like we're just running around inside a word game where um, the apologists have been trying to juice this for as much uh, mileage as they can get out of it, but we're, we're not resting our feet on anything solid and firm whatsoever, right? I mean, I'm just plucking counter examples out of thin air, and I think that's where the original argument came from as well. Mm. So I'm not, not particularly impressed. Uh, right. So we can keep going and like take a different set of logic and say, well, my God is better because he's not as bound as your God is. Yeah. Illogical God who's not bound right. by logic at all. Who can do even the logically impossible things. I don't know. Is that better? It seems like he can do more. Well, is there any way to even prove what is or is not better? Or is it more something that someone would believe intuitively? Like they. Think, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't think a great God would be able to do contradictory things or vice versa or something like that. Yeah, right. And I do. And then who, how do we know which one is right? Greatness is an inherently subjective notion, it seems. Yeah, so there's not really any way to convince somebody of it unless you could maybe give them counterexamples that show that there's some contradiction in their definition of greatness or that they really do believe that this is a great thing, but they're claiming it's not. Yeah. But, I mean, without absent those things. Um, and anyway, so let's say we had a conversation and I didn't think that being maximally generous was a great making property, and then you convinced me that it is. Um, does that actually mean that it is? Um, or does that just mean that I now agree with you? Um, or just mean you would agree with me. Yeah. So... Um, there's a difference here between um, persuasion and proof, right? The, what are we trying to do? I mean, um, any method of persuasion which isn't actually guaranteeing that the thing's true um, is inherently less persuasive once that penny's dropped. So I mean, if, if you manage to persuade someone, say you manage to persuade me, the great making, the generosity is a great making property. Um, and then James pipes up, well, that doesn't actually mean it's true. That just means now that you agree with Dylan, um, I'm actually going to go, oh yeah, that's right. I'm now less persuaded by what you've just done there as a, as a tactic for trying to establish that God exists. It's, it's um, undermined by the very fact that it's not really a method of proof. So the problem is what we're doing is we're just talking about subjective notion um, and you getting you to persuade me to change my subjective notion so that it agrees with yours um, is never really going it, to... We're just dancing around... Um, the topic we're trying to it's supposed to be a proof that god exists it's not supposed to be um a series of things that you can say which makes me agree with you and that those are two different things right it's just, they look quite similar of course um but but they're they're not the same thing right so if i'm just using it as a tool to change your subjective notion to match mine then it's just a piece of rhetoric and it's not a proof for anything yeah exactly you may as well put a gun to my head or yeah. drug meals. <laughs> Don't give us any ideas, Alex. <laughs> <laughs>